Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about predictors of religious literacy. My name is Nikki Tusi, and I'm doing this research at California State University, East Bay. So what do I mean by religious literacy? Well, this was a term that was uh, uh, popularized by Stephen Prothero and Diane Moore's research on um, religious literacy or religious illiteracy. Um, and a lot of this research focuses on people from the United States. So with apologies to uh, our Canadian friends and, and others, when we talk about Americans, we tend to focus on members of the uh, within the United States. So uh, research suggests that Americans tend to be considered quite religious, um, with three out of four identifying with a religion. And this is in comparison with um, you know, other, other nations that are similarly wealthy. Uh, but only half of American adults could identify even one of the four gospels, uh, which are the four books in the Bible uh, that talk about the life of Jesus. And when it comes to other religions, um, their knowledge is even uh, patchier, less than 15% could name one of the five pillars of Islam or one of the four noble truths of Buddhism. So this research uh, suggests that while people might identify themselves as religious, they don't necessarily know that much about their own or other religions. Uh, the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life ran a survey to test a broad range of religious knowledge uh, among Americans uh, overall. On average, uh, Americans only correctly answered about half of the 32 questions on that measure. Um, however, higher scores uh, higher religious literacy was linked with more positive attitudes towards members of most religions. So um, linked with more positive attitudes towards um, Jewish people, Muslims, Buddhists. Uh, the only exception in this case was that uh, not necessarily evangelical Christians, but overall you see that there is this tendency for more religious knowledge to be linked with more positive attitudes towards members of other religions than your own. So one question that arose is what predicted higher performance? Now in the Pew study, they found that religious identity um, itself predicted more knowledge and actually atheists and agnostics uh, as well as Jewish people tended to do the best on this measure of religious uh, literacy. Uh, education made a difference so that more educated people also did better and interfaith contacts. So the people with more diverse networks of friends religiously also knew more about other religions. But we don't know much about the underlying psychological mechanisms. And that's kind of the purpose of the research that uh, I did was to look at what, uh, what um, psychological mechanisms, mechanisms might predict this religious literacy. So I've got two studies. One of them is focused on essentialism and the other one is focused on measures of religiosity and cognitive approaches. So we'll talk more about that as we get through that. However, one thing that I wanted to do was to create a new measure. So most of the previous measures that had been used um, by Gallup, by the Pew Forum, were predominantly about the Bible and Christianity, many of the questions. So I wanted to create something that was a little bit more uh, balanced in terms of representation of the, the major world religions. So, um, with my lab, I created a new 42 item measure for a more balanced overview. And we started by uh, asking, uh, as part of another study, about 325 people what basic facts everyone should know about their religion. And based on this, we put together a measure that had five questions, each on the Baha'i faith, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, Sikhi, and seven questions on other identities which included uh, Zoroastrianism, Shintoism, atheism, agnosticism, Wiccanism, uh, Unitarian Universalists, and Taoism. And these questions, especially the, the sets of five, address the origin, the holy text or the scripture, the, the prophet founder, um, maybe the holy days and beliefs and practices of each of these religions. So they were kind of uh, similar or comparable across the different groups. So some examples of the questions that we used uh, was uh, the Bhagavad Gita is an epic poem consisting of a dialogue between a mortal prince Arjuna and who uh, the book of Exodus tells the story of the Israelites escape from slavery in which country Jesus was renowned for using a particular type of storytelling, what is it called Islam, uh, what is the Shahada and what is the Baha'i perspective on science now. <laughs> 
you realize that I'm asking these questions, I'm not giving the answers. So maybe that'll uh, inspire you to go out and, and look them up if you don't know them already. But what the participants actually saw was the question and a multiple choice uh, set of answers to choose from. Now, in all of these cases, we had three different question options, three different answer alternatives. Um, and then one last one was they always had the option just to say, I don't know, and uh, basically not answer the question. Um, so you know, in this case, uh, science and religion complement each other is the correct answer. Um, and we'll see how people did on that. So that was our measure, 42 items. Um, and in study one, we were curious about the role of essentialism, religious essentialism in predicting these, these literacy outcomes. So we had 269 American participants were recruited using an online platform. They were predominantly Christian uh, with a substantial number of atheists, agnostics, and spiritual but not religious. And out of that 42 question religious literacy quiz, um, the average score was 17.2. So if they had out of those 42 questions, just randomly guessed between one of the three actual answer options, um, they would have gotten a 14. So you can see that the average score isn't that much higher than that ch chance guessing score. And it was because a lot of people did use the I don't know option. Um, so they completed that quiz. They also completed four measures of religious essentialism. So I'm gonna spend a little, few slides now telling you about religious essentialism. And this is the idea that people use the word religion to mean different things. Uh, there's a range of ways in which membership in different religions is construed. So in some religions, membership is ascribed at birth based on heritage. It's basically very similar to ethnicity. It's kind of seen as ethnicity. Whereas other religions consider membership to be based on what a person believes to be true in their heart. Um, so this is sometimes described as a difference between uh, descent-based religions and ascent-based religions. And what we found is that perceptions of specific religious groups actually reflect this range so that some groups are seen as um, more about belief, more kind of flexible. People can leave or come or go depending on, um, depending on what, they, what they believe at that moment. So we see that you know, down here, you've got spiritual but not religious and atheist really falling into that category. And then, then, then as you move up, um, different religious groups are seen as more and more essentialized uh, or more kind of inherent or ethnicity based until you come up to Judaism, Hinduism, and interestingly enough, hit, uh, Islam are perceived to be more uh, about uh, your kind of heritage or your ethnicity, something you're born into. So we had four different measures for this, this concept of essentialism, and two of them were about your own religion. So. Um, both of them were developed by Cohen and Hill. One of them was the ascent scale. So for example, being a member of my religion or faith is a matter of what a person believes in their heart. My religion or faith mostly cares about what a person believes in their heart. Um, and then we edited the one about the, the original one that I mentioned God to be more generally about a set of beliefs about spiritual topics to allow for a broader applicability in our sample. And then there was the descent scale, which, you know, ask people to imagine somebody was born into a different religion, but then adopted into your, into a, as an infant, into a family of your religion. Is that person a true member of your religion or faith? Yes, if they go undergo a formal conversion, um, but you know, this idea of biology playing a role in determining someone's religion kind of plays a part in this descent scale. Um, and then the two other measures that we had were um, generalized, uh, religious uh, essentialism. So this idea, not just about your own religion, how you identify, but more generally, um, no one can change his or her religions. You are what you are. Uh, siblings born to the same parents will always be of the same religion as each other. A person's religion is fixed at birth, et cetera. So this is the generalized conceptions of religion. And then finally, we included one that was more about your personal identification. So how do you, how do you identify your own um, uh, the, the reason that you are the religion that you are. So what we found was that two of those scales did predict 
the score on the religious literacy exam. And those two were the ascent scales. So the more that people felt that their religion was about what they believed in their heart, the more they were likely to know more about other religions. And the religious conception scale, which is your sense of religions as a whole in general. So the more that people believed that other religions were um, were determined by biology, that uh, they're not changeable, that siblings were you know, born into the same family would be of the same religion. Um, so the more people believed in that kind of biological or, or genetic based uh, basis of religion, the, the less they were likely to um, uh, have high scores on the religious literacy quiz. <clears throat> so one of the things that that kind of highlights is that the, the way that we conceptualize religion, the way that we think about it as being um, determined by choice or by ethnicity shapes the efforts that we make to go out and learn more about it. And I think this is part of why, you know, in many of his, his uh, utterances and his talks throughout his travels in the West of Bilbaha, one of the first principles that you would highlight to the American audiences and the Canadian audiences was the importance of independent investigation of the truth and not just kind of blindly imitating um, the traditions of the past, but really seeking out, um, seeking out truth. So I think he was kind of speaking to this, um, this need to, um, to, to go in and, and uh, part of that also is, is evident, I think, in, in some of the findings from the study too. So in study two, we had 447 participants. Again, uh, this time it was a representative sample uh, in America, um, recruited online through a different uh, platform, prolific academic. Again, they were predominantly Christians, uh, agnostic atheist, and spiritual but not religious. Um, again, they completed the religious literacy quiz. The average score was 20.7 in the sample. And they completed several measures of religiosity, which I'll talk about on the next slide and two cognitive measures. Uh, they also reported how much they had studied texts about their own and other religions, how religiously diverse their networks were and how important religion was to their identity. So we'll have a two-step um, uh, data analysis here. So to go through some of these sample items from these measures, extrinsic religiosity um, actually splits into two. One of them was kind of personal extrinsic religiosity. So what religion offers me most is comfort in times of trouble or sorrow. Um, and then there's social extrinsic religiosity, which is I attend religious services mostly to spend time with friends. So this is a sense of what does religion kind of bring to you? Um, what, what do you get out of religion? Um, and another measure of religiosity is intrinsic religiosity. So I try hard to live all my life according to my religious beliefs really more a sense of why, what religion kind of does to guide you as your personal behavior. <clears throat> when you have quest religiosity, um, which is uh, a sample item would be questions are more, far more central to my religious experience than uh, answers. And then the two cognitive approaches uh, that we looked at were intellectual humility, which is, for example, I question my own opinions, positions, and viewpoints because they could be wrong. And finally, need for cognition. So this kind of intellectual curiosity, I find satisfaction in deliberating hard and for long hours. I enjoy complex problems, that sort of thing. So all of these in some way we, might, we thought might be uh, relevant to religious literacy. They might predict um, people's scores. And what we found when we put these into a regression um, with, uh, with religious literacy scores as the outcome, was that uh, three of these subscales or scales did significantly predict religious literacy. So extrinsic personal uh, was a negative predictor so that the more people um, relied on, thought about religion as you know, serving to you know, help them in, in troubled times, um, the less they were likely to know about other religions. The more that they viewed religion in terms of intrinsic value, in terms of a guide for their life, uh, the more they were likely to know about other religions. And finally, that need for cognition uh, factor, which was, again, that like intellectual curiosity, desire to know more, desire to think deeply about things, also predicted 
um, more, uh, more religious knowledge. <clears throat> and then when we added in um, how much people had spent time studying different religions, uh, how important religion was to them and the diversity of their community, we see that um, uh, while studying religions more and having a diverse community more, uh, predicted more religious literacy. The, the one uh, independent variable, uh, the, 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 the original measure um, need for cognition was the one that stayed significant. So kind of robustly shows that again, the more people desire uh, to grapple with complex issues and think deeply about things, the more that they uh, were likely to score higher on the, the um, religious literacy uh, quiz. So in summary, we found these kind of two things emerging from these results. One was essentialism. So how we perceive the basis for religious identification predicts how we educate ourselves about other religions. If religious identities in general are seen as changeable, as flexible, then people tend to know more about other religious traditions. And also need for cognition, the desire to think deeply, explore and understand the world also consistently predicts religious literacy. Um, and this type of religious intellectual curiosity is associated with more knowledge about religions. I think one of the, the examples that stands out to me in my mind was I, I was running participants in the study and at the end of the study, someone is filling out the demographic form and there's a list of you know, 25 different religious identities that they could choose from. And I see this person pull out their phone and take a picture of that list and scroll down and then take another picture. And I thought that's, you know, that's a classic example of intellectual cure, that, of need for cognition. Um, this person is seeing all these names of different religions and is capturing them because I think he wanted to go and look them up later. So we have these two, uh, these two things that kind of highlight what it is that leads people to learn more about other religions and hopefully have more positive attitudes um, towards members of other religions. So one last uh, piece of information I wanted to share, because we had these, these groupings of, uh, of questions from different religions, we could actually kind of come and see what are the patterns of how much people know uh, religion by a religion. And I've got them here, the, the graphs are in alphabetical order, but you'll see that there's um, you know, differences between how much people know. So people tend to know quite a bit about Christianity. They tend to get more of these questions correct. Um, and similarly, we've got Judaism and, and Islam, people tend to get most of those questions correct. Um, moderately so, uh, the other, other religions, um, uh, the, the other five religions, um, I excluded atheism and agnosticism from this set of five just to make it comparable and because people tended to get those right. Uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. And then you've got the, uh, the Baha'i faith here and Sikhi here, where interestingly enough, the majority of people score zero. Now, again, this is out of five questions with three potential answer options each. So if you're just guessing randomly, you're likely to get one or two. Um, but I think in these cases, people didn't feel confident enough. People were just not familiar enough so that they got to those questions and they just kind of shrugged. Instead of even trying to make a guess, they just kind of shrugged and said, I really don't know. So I think that suggests that we can go a long way in, um, in, in particular um, for, for the Pai faith and for, for Sikhi, we can go a long way to just making people more familiar with um, the existence of, the basic tenets of, the principles of, um, of, of these religions so that we can uh, increase that religious literacy um, more generally and, and help people understand more. So that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I wanna thank my research assistants and uh, support from my university and thank you for listening. <laughs>